No justice, no peace. I'm Alana. I'm Kalia. I'm Donnie. And I'm Janelle. And welcome to DMLK's The Take. This series will address the inequity students face in education today. We will discuss how to keep our resolution alive by having conversations with key people involved in the implementation, sustainability, and overall success of our resolution. In last week's episode, we talked to Georgia Department Chairs, Cappy King Chapman, Susan Orlitzine, and Anna Pendleton. During this podcast, we discussed the plans of each district department chair and how they plan to carry out the No Justice, No Peace resolution. They each discussed changes that are happening within their content department, and it made me super proud to see our passion, efforts, and influence within the, within the district. So I'm sure y'all are wondering, what's up this week? This is our take on mask off. Yep, the phrase mask off is a reference to taking off a facade and revealing the truth underneath. Today, we will be discussing the importance of helping adults to take their mask off of their unconscious bias in order to teach in an anti-racist classroom environment. In today's episode, we'll be speaking to Leslie Janelle, the Executive Director of Culture, Equity, and Leadership, Dr. Danielle Harris, the Senior Manager of Equity Initiatives, and Dr. Fanita Ware, the Program Manager of Equity Initiatives. Welcome and thank you for joining us on The Take today. Before we get started, we have to remind our listeners about our trigger alert. Donnie, can you please read the trigger alert? If you are not 110% in support of Black Lives Matter, please dismiss yourself. If you are in any sort of agreement with the systematic oppressions this country has inflicted on minorities, once again, please dismiss yourself. And if you are not willing to give every bit of the power that the people so undeniably deserve, then please dismiss yourself. Because in a few moments, we will witness vast amounts of Black engagement. And if you do not dismiss yourself, then the thoughts, facts, and feelings we are about to share will most definitely dismiss you. Before we get started, let's frame this conversation. As you may notice, all of us on this podcast are Black women. Black women who have a common goal of contributing to and creating equity throughout Denver Public Schools and hopefully beyond. All too often, Black women are pitted against each other. And if you're a longtime listener, you know we hold no bars or spare any words when it comes to one thing, the truth. In each podcast, we post questions that reflect our concerns, which may make our guests uncomfortable. That is not our intention. We simply desire to discuss pertinent issues of our hearts and minds, but potential discomfort can deter us from our goal. After all, this work would not have come to fruition if it weren't for the discomfort of our principal, Ms. Grayson Felt, when the DMLK students called her out for the lack of focus on Black representation in the curriculum and in the school. She took accountability, and that allowed our school to grow tremendously. We have to be willing to be uncomfortable in order to grow, because when you are comfortable with the situation, there will be no change or progression. An issue we have within DPS is that we're gotten too comfortable accepting some of the things that need improvement within our district. That doesn't mean it won't change, only that we aren't there yet. We're truly passionate about equity work and making certain that people of color have representation in DPS. We will ensure this work is carried out and expedited because as students, some of us are about to graduate and we don't have time to wait. As you view this podcast, please see us as students expecting our district to push themselves as hard as they can to see us succeed. Students first. All right, let's get into our talk today. Hi, ladies. Let's give the listeners some quick background here. Where are you from? What are a few things you would like our listeners to know about you? And what brought you all into the equity department? So as um, has been stated before, I am Leslie Janelle. I am a native of Denver, Colorado and a proud DPS graduate. As you can see, I am a graduate of the Montbello Warriors, the Legacy Warriors, yep, many years ago, but still a proud warrior. I have lived in this Montbello area since I was in the fourth grade, five generations of my family, from my grandparents to my grandkids are in DPS and have graduated from DPS. In fact, as I was thinking about this, my sister, was a part of the first group of students to go to MLK when it was first built. My daughter even went to MLK and and now I have grandkids that are in DPS. Um, In my current role as the executive director of uh, the equity and inclusion uh, team, I am excited to lead. I, I, you know, if anyone had asked me a year ago if I would be leading this team, I would have said, you are absolutely out of your mind. Um, Although I've been with DPS for 12 years, the bulk of that time was really in designing and facilitating adult learning. Um, Previously to taking this position about a year ago, um, I was leading the work of the African American Equity Task Force and implementing what the community said they wanted in terms of 
continuing to push black excellence forward. Then that kind of morphed into the black excellence resolution. We can talk more about that. But it, it shows me that when you're tapped for leadership, even though I was resistant and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. Um, and I said, if not me, who, if not now, when? It was, it was time. And so I think that it's important just for me to name that I always have believed that I stumbled upon this work. Um, but when I look back at my time, really in direct service to students, I think about my time at Youth Biz or in Girl Scouts or Girls Inc. or Inroads. And I realized that my entire career, I've been advocating for youth, for marginalized youth. Um, and so that is what uh, is sitting with me right now. Um, I, I am very excited again to be in this work. I can tell you that the work is heavy. <laughs> it's like going 10 rounds every day with a heavyweight boxer of injustice. Some days I go back in my corner, I wipe off the sweat, drink some more water, come back out swinging the next day. So really excited to be here today. Um, and then when we come back from the, uh, the introducing the other team members, I just want to set some context about our team with the culture, equity, and leadership. Thank you. All right, so I am Dr. Danielle Heron. I'm excited to be here today. Um, I too am a proud graduate of Denver Public Schools. I graduated from Mount Bello High School um, as well. Uh, not at the same time as Leslie, but not too far behind. Um, I was also in the inaugural class at DMLK. So um, I started MLK in seventh grade, the first year it opened. Um, I have two daughters who are both products of Denver Public Schools. One graduated in 2017, and then one is a senior this year. They both attended East High School, so I have a dual loyalty that uh, sometimes comes into question. But um, that's you know a little bit about me. I've been a classroom teacher. Um, I taught at Hallett Fundamental Academy for several years before going into central office. I'm also um, a licensed special educator, as well as a former gifted and talented teacher. So I try to um, use those different lenses to really impact how I show up today. Um, it was in my work at Hallett, which is you know one of the district's primarily African-American schools, um, that I realized that equity and culturally responsiveness needs to be who we are and what we do. Um, and so that really um, kind of provided that foundation for me to come into this work to support on a greater level. So just not just the classroom, but to impact leaders, educators, central office folks all throughout our district. So that's why I am on the equity um, team. And that's why I believe I've been brought to this work. Hello, I'm excited to be here today. Thank you for inviting us. I am Dr. Fanita Ware. I am not from Denver. Denver is my home of choice. In fact, I've lived here twice. I am from Atlanta, Georgia. And the way I came into doing this work is I integrated a white high school, uh, one of 15 black students out of 800 students. It was a political choice on my mother's um, point. It was not that she felt that I was gonna get a better experience with white students. It was the politics the political climate of the time, and she felt that I was capable of doing the work, of being in that environment. Um, no one in my family had done anything like that before. My brothers attended the black high school in my neighborhood. And I remember times of her getting up in the dark to make a really good breakfast for me. So I would have the strength and resiliency to go and do the work that was part of being in that school. Um, I was tested and should have been in gifted classes and I was not placed in gifted classes. So years later, when I got into education and I've taught first grade, fifth grade, I've taught at Spelman College and I've taught graduate school here in Denver. I felt that all those lived experiences prepared me to really understand that I didn't want students like me sitting in the classroom, knowing that they're capable of a more rigorous and intensive work, not seeing anyone who looked like them, hearing curriculum that did not resonate with them. And I work now, this is my purpose. And I'm very clear about that. This is my purpose to do all that I can in central administration through CELT, an amazing team that I have the opportunity to work with to make sure that 
I am helping the people who make policy in Denver Public Schools understand the significance of creating equity and the lived experiences of students who are like me. So thank you for having me here today. Um, I just like to thank you all for being here once again just hearing your experiences and what led you to the equity department here. It's definitely just good to hear in general, just to know where you all come from. And specifically, I'd like to congratulate you, Dr. Harris, on your connections with Kamala Harris. That's amazing. I, I genuinely didn't know that. That's just so great to hear. And just to move into my first question, Ms. Janelle, as the, director, as the Executive Director of Culture and Equity and Leadership, can you begin by telling our listeners what our district's definition of equity is? Yes, thank you um, for that question. Can I just provide a little bit of context about our team and how we're made up, just so that there's um, some understanding about that? So as you all know, DPS is about 15,000 team members um, strong. And our team, you know, I think back to a couple of years ago, our team was as large as about 19 people. And today we're nine people. And when I think about that and the, the work that we do, um, you know, we've had ongoing conversations about do we start things, do we stop, do we continue things, just to, to be able to lift quality work. Um, but every member of our team is from a marginalized community. And I think that's important just to name. Um, but we are still guilty of perpetuating systems of inequity. Right, we all are, whether we come from the dominant culture or from the uh, marginalized community. So that's important for us to, to, to name. Um, also, we are part of the equity engagement, equity and engagement department, which is five teams. So it makes up our team, our NACE team, our Native American culture and education team, our FACE team, family and community engagement, the ELKS team, extended learning, um, and, and CELT. So we're, we are a pretty dynamic team, pretty large team. And um, a lot of the work that we do is either in our values-based leadership, so adult learning, or our equity initiatives, again, um, where we talk about the African-American Equity Task Force and the Black Excellence Resolution. Um, in terms of our definition of equity, so this has evolved over time. I can tell you that the roots of the definition are um, with our with our central office team in 2012, we brought over 1,200 team members together during our DPS day to talk about, um, you know, what are our values? We had a mission, we had a vision, but we didn't have values. And so as adults, what are the things that we need to do to make sure that we are, um, you know, leading and uh, working with students in a, in a very direct way, those of us that work with students in a direct way or indirectly, what are those things? So again, we met 1,200 team members from across the district, came up with the six shared core values. One of those was equity. When our previous superintendent, Susanna Cordova, came into leadership and she named equity as the core of our identity here in DPS, um, we knew that the definition we previously had was not rigorous enough to carry us to this next level of work in DPS as we pursue racial and educational equity. And so um, various teams came together and talked about, you know, what, what should this definition be? What should it look like? We even did research with some of the most preeminent minds in, in equity from the Pedro Nagueros to the Dr. Eddie Ferguses, um, Zaretta Hammonds. And what we came up with was, was a, a, a definition um, but when we started to kind of socialize it within the, the adult ranks, the central office, the board, our extended leadership team, our SLT team, it wasn't strong enough. They really weren't feeling it. They didn't like it. And so our FACE team took it out as part of the community engagement process for the Denver plan, which has since been put on hold. And so that work was put on hold. But we had a temporary definition and um, because we needed to anchor it in our equity experience work, which we will talk about more later. Since then, what we did was um, come up, drafted what we call our equity statement, because we believe that an equity definition, there's so much personal that people bring to a definition. But if we as a district and the adults make the commitment in the district with this statement, right, that our, our statement includes, and let me just read it to you, Racial and educational equity is our collective responsibility. We will achieve equity. And when we dismantle deeply rooted systems of oppression that have historically resulted 
in equitable access and distribution of opportunities and resources for those who represent marginalized identities, including race, ethnicity, gender, identity, sexual orientation, language, and ability. We will create conditions where we are all where we all belong and are included, have clear purpose, our why, and have the autonomy to lead in our respective areas. By creating these conditions, we will eliminate the predictability of success or failure for our students and team members. So that is the statement that we um, decided to you know, put forth. That is what we stand on as an adult community here in BPS. So we got away from a definition. This is our statement. This is our commitment. Thank you, Ms. Snell. Um, I know that this school year has been unlike any other, and our principal started the school year by saying that we aren't coming back the same. With the raging pandemic of COVID-19, the public and private displays of police brutality, and murders that still have no justice, the in-your-face racial injustices, and people, corporations, and other organizations simply saying that Black Lives Matter and doing nothing more, not to mention that the, the protest that had occurred on January 6th at the Capitol, we know that students just like us are not the same. And if students are not the same, then adults need to understand how we feel and why we aren't the same. So with that being said, can you tell us what you've done to equip all educators in DPS with the tools to support every student specifically for this school year? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll just name that. It is a collaborative effort. Uh, we partner very closely with our impact team. We partner with our schools team. We partner with our academics team. And so what our team is um, scoped to do and what we have committed to do is to really challenge the adult mindsets in DPS, to challenge the beliefs, to challenge the um, behaviors, right? Not setting expectations high for all students, to challenge the comparison of students of color to white students as the standard, to challenge the systems, the white supremacy culture system that exists in DPS that says that whiteness is rightness. That is the work that our team has done. Um, we've done that through an, a number of ways. One is through the uh, equity experience. So the equity experience comes out of the Black Excellence Resolution, and I probably should provide some additional history here. So you all are probably familiar with the Bailey Report that came out in 2016, I wanna say. That was a report that outlined the experiences that Black team members um, were having in DPS. And um, the, the feedback from that was then turned into the Bailey Report, which is available, it's a public report. There's an executive summary that anyone can read um, just to get the gist of what it is, because it is a very large report. Um, and from that, the community said, we want a, a task force to sit down and come up with the recommendations for how we are going to change and improve the experiences of Black um, team members and, and, and families and students in DPS. And so as a result of that, um, the, the community, we submitted, I think it was 29 recommendations in the beginning. We were able to um, kind of collapse those into 11 recommendations and that became the African American Equity Task Force. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, I was responsible for beginning to implement that. And what I can tell you is that when a system wants to be resistant, it can be resistant. Um, for some people, it did not matter that this was a, a, um, a recommendation, did not matter that the board had adopted it. Um, there was resistance along the way. There was pushback about why we were asking these questions or why we were pushing this work. And so in December of 2018, we went to the, the former Board of Education and said, we need your help. We need you to draw a line in the sand. We need you to, uh, to outline for us and make it clear what the non-negotiables are going to be in this work. And so as a result of that, um, they wrote the Black Excellence Resolution. In the Black Excellence Resolution names three systems. One, that all T DPS team members will be trained ongoing in um, implicit bias, right? 
Um, as facilitators, our backgrounds are in, again, design of adult learning, facilitation of training. We knew that just putting people into a class or into a training wasn't gonna be compliant. It was not going to get the work done that we needed to get done. And so we created the equity experience. The second part of the Black Excellence Resolution says that all schools will have a Black Excellence Plan. And so what I can tell you today is that while those plans are still evolving, while we're still digging deep, our schools team is leading that work, but while the, our raises and rises are still having conversations to make those plans um, more strong or stronger, um, we have, every school has a plan. And then the third area is around um, the central office. We believe that this is one of the most important areas because this is where inequity tends to root itself. We are being charged as a district with remedying historical inequity, decades of inequity. And so we have to take a deeper look at ourselves, at our systems, our structures, our practices and policies to say, where is this or originating? Not focusing on symptoms of the bigger problem, but where is it originating? And so we are in the process of a partnership with an external organization to help us in examining ourselves of the, where, where these things um, are rooted. So that is uh, some of what our team uh, is responsible for. And, and I, again, I would reiterate that it really is in helping people to shift their mindsets. It's challenging to take people and ask them to rethink something that they've been taught all of their lives or that they've heard or that um, is a part of their value system. And so it's it's heavy work, but that is the primary work of our team. I think yeah. reasons. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. I was just going to add on to what Leslie was saying. Um, Janelle, you had mentioned, like, you know, during COVID, during, you know, recent protests, during the um, untimely and heinous deaths of Black Americans, what are some of the other things that we've done? Um, we have provided opportunities for folks from across the district to engage in like, what we call just-in-time learning. And so those were kind of bite-sized trainings that were virtual, um, that were um, sent out to everyone in the district that they could just kind of go through. So some of those topics was around self-care. How do you heal? How do you develop trust as we go into times of COVID? So those are some of the things that we did. In addition to having some open dialogue recently about um, how are people feeling after the insurrection at the Capitol, after um, and during, you know, while we're living all of these um, hypocrisies, what did it look like during the Black Lives Matter protests versus what it looked like at the Capitol protests. Um, and so we were able to offer an opportunity for team members to come together and just process some of, you know, what they're feeling, how this impacts their work, um, and what we need to do to continue to heal and move forward. So in addition to some of those larger things that we've done, we, you know, we are um, trying to be responsive to the needs of individuals and knowing it can't just be business as usual um, on January 7th that we have to, we had to process what we witnessed. Um, so I just wanted to add that in. The work you've all done sounds very reflective which moves us right into our next question, which is anchored in an important truth because what gets measured matters. As you have developed a framework for addressing equity, you must also find ways to measure, quantify, and report on this important work, especially when working to dismantle systems that have been in place for years. What are the measurable goals around equity and inclusion in DPS? I wanna step in here because my colleagues have been talking a lot. I feel like I need to be vocal here. I'm gonna start not with um, some of the bigger measurements that are, that are done through the impact office, but I wanna talk about in doing the work one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So I wanna give you the example of, I've been working specifically with a team on helping them to examine their racial identity, their cultural and racial identity, and how that impacts their replication of white supremacy culture. I've done that with one of my colleagues from CELT for over a year. And as a qualitative researcher, I look at examples of changes in behavior, changes in languages, and how the work is, is rolled forward to the people that they support. Because again, we're a central office, and so the work always rolls forward to another group of people. Uh, this team that we work with specifically, 
this past August, uh, you know, when teachers have teacher work days, they rolled out the work that we've been doing to those teachers who are responsible for making sure that um, uh, BIPOC students are identified and have a safe and rigorous environment once they're identified to go into gifted classrooms. They rolled out the work using the, using the language that I had used, my colleague had used, and really helping their teachers understanding white, understand white supremacy culture and how that impacted the work they did. So that's just one example of how it's measured um, through qualitative measures, again, identifying behaviors, changes in language, changes in behaviors, and how they roll that out. But there are other ways that things want to be things are measured, uh, the equity work that we do is measured, but I wanted to give that as a specific example. Yeah, thanks Dr. Ware. Um, some of the other ways that we have been measuring equity in the district last year was our first year requiring that all of our central office team members had an equity and inclusion goal. And that was um, really a big deal, a success for us to say that each individual on a central office team is intentionally working towards um, equity for their team, for our students and our communities. Um, that was last year. We also have a required equity goal this year that both years have been rooted in the completion of the equity experience, which Leslie framed a little bit earlier, um, which is that ongoing, right now it's a two year um, ongoing training around cultural responsive education, implicit bias, um, et cetera. And so that's one way. Another way that we um, really believe that in order to measure equity is we have to look at people's actions and their beliefs and their mindsets. And we know that that takes time. I know Leslie referenced it um, earlier that systems of beliefs and, and what people, um, how they see us, how they see racism, how they see white supremacy has been developed in their lives, their entire lives. So we know that it takes time and commitment to impacting and changing some of those belief systems. And so with the equity experience, before our team members engage in it, they take a mindset survey and then at the completion of the first year of the experience, we offer another survey um, with the same questions to see where we have impacted as a, as a system. And then along with that, the monthly modules also have a self-reported um, qualitative piece to it where um, members that go through it assess where they see themselves shifting, where they have made changes, um, to what extent, et cetera. So we really look at that data as well um, each month to see where are people making these changes. May I add another point? And so the next step of the equity experience is something we're about to roll out. Actually, this week the intro will go out and it's called the equity projects. And so the different components that they learned from the nine modules from the equity experience now will be applied to examining the, examining the work of their team and examining first their team dynamics because it's my belief that if the team dynamics are not healthy, then they can't make a healthy decision about what type of equity project they'll do. The equity project then will look at the work that they're responsible for. So again, their sphere of influence, their locus of control, and which, which policies, practice, or structures replicate systems of oppression or, or interrupt racial educational, educational equity. And then they are responsible for creating a project. And so that'll be starting this spring. Of course, we'll be doing a lot of support on that, but I just wanna give you a high level understanding of that. And so then they'll be looking at how they can disrupt the inequitable practices within their own team scope of work. So that's the continuation of that work and then the application of that work. Thanks, Dr. Ware. And I'll just add that, you know, even the phrase, what, measure, what matters is measured, um, it implies that what doesn't get measured doesn't matter. And that's not the truth. Um, we definitely have so many other pieces of our work um, that across the district that gets measured, but the things that get um, publicized are, the, are those big goals. And so what um, the team has has named are, are, are really important. But I would say that, you know, even though we don't name some things that get measured, they they do. 
And I would also say that, you know, measurement looks different in each department or division. So for example, in our academics team, they are measuring learning and growth um, right now with COVID about remote learning and engagement. I think about our, our SEO, our student equity and opportunity team, they measure well-being, right? Um, they measure the access to, as Dr. Ware has stated, gifted and talented or other rigorous course, I'm sorry, not rigorous courses, but gifted and talented, or the um, referrals to, to discipline or to special education. If I think about finance, they measure distribution of financial resources across the district. HR, which has been a focal point, is the recruitment retention of um, teachers and other staff members, particularly of color in our spaces. And then like with our face team, that they measure engagement of students and family um, in these conversations. So um, the measurements look different in different departments, but everyone is measuring um, something that is visible and maybe things that aren't as visible. There are ELA goals for each school and there are special education goals for each school. Are there large equity goals for the district or based on equity experience, are there equity goals for each individual school? So I would say that the, the equity goals are within the frame of a, an individual school. Um, I'm sure you are aware that DPS is a, a decentralized district, which says that schools really are the um, center of, of, of change, right? That leaders have a lot of autonomy in how they um, work, what curriculum comes into their schools, that kind of thing. And so um, each school leader, and I'm sure it cascades down to their, their staff, they have their own equity goals. What I would say as a district goal, um, as I mentioned earlier, would be the Black Excellence Resolution in schools. That is a goal, that all schools would have a Black Excellence Resolution. Then you start to look at the different levels of evaluation in that. Um, in terms of the central office, the, um, the Black Excellence Resolution saying that all team members will have ex Im implicit bias training continuous is a district goal. And I also wanna point out um, the, the whole concept of what is required and mandated. As Dr. Harris alluded to, like this was the first year, last year was the first year that we were able to get anything required of our work. It has historically been optional. And um, there, there's a lot of that to unpack, but depending on who is in leadership at the time, um, some people have a greater appetite to say, you must do this versus you can do it if you'd like to. And one of the things that our former superintendent brought was she made it very clear that at the central office level and ultimately throughout the district, all team members will participate um, through the Black Excellence Resolution in implicit bias training. I'd just like to comment really quickly on one thing that I, I don't want there to be any misconceptions. Um, what Donnie said specifically regarding that what is measured matters, that doesn't, we weren't necessarily saying that what isn't measured doesn't matter, but we're saying that what is measured specifically, like if you're serving students or staff about things like implicit bias training and issues with just biases in general, we need to not only look at what's being measured because that's important, like that's the actual evidence, but also everything needs to be measured because everything matters. So I feel like just to clarify a little bit. Yep, thank you for that. Absolutely. And just to move into the next question, we all know that student voice is extraordinary. And unfortunately, it's, an, uh, it's often an untapped source of information that shouldn't be left out of the picture because how else will the district know if they're creating an equitable and respectful learning environment? So can you guys talk to us about the changes your department has made with the data collected from the part of the district that surveys students? And how often do students support discussing issues of race, ethnicity, and culture in school? And how much do students feel like they belong? I'll, I'll take the first um, swing at that. So yes, the ultimate question is we do survey. Our team does not survey, but we work in conjunction again, with other teams, primarily our impact team. The impact team um, does a number of perception surveys throughout the district. So whether it's with staff, families, students, um, they, they really lead that work. And then there are multiple teams that then examine the data to, to decide how, you know, what is within our scope 
And then how do we begin to address the information that we learned? And so we have in the district this year because of COVID um, and because we don't have a revised or an updated Denver plan, we have what are called crisis priorities. There are four crisis priorities. The first is around um, health and safety. Excuse me. The second is around social and emotional well being. The third is around learning. So, unfinished learning, unfinished teaching. And then the fourth, which is more in our wheelhouse, is around equity. And so, this was the first year. And you all may have, you all may remember, you may have gotten a survey in December. I can't remember the exact dates when the team sent it out, but you may have re remember getting a survey that asked, you know, four or five questions. To directly to students, um, third grade through 12th grade, I believe it was, about their experience in grappling with the concept of race in their school and in their classroom. You know, how does your team, how does your school talk about race? How do they prepare you to talk about race? Um, you know, how does your, your school prepare you to speak out about race? And so um, those questions were asked right before the break, I believe it was. And so we will start to dig into uh, once we have a, you know, a, a presentation, basically the impact team will bring the summary to us, share the data with us. And once we do that, then we as a team will look at, so what might this mean for schools? And then we'll have um, a conversation or, or a, a collaboration potentially with our schools team or with our academics team to say, so what, what does this imply for you in your work? Um, directly with students? How do we take what we're hearing from students and be able to address the areas um, that they have shared with us? When I think about, you know, the health and safety or the well-being, I do know that there was half, I think half of the students who responded to the survey said that with their well-being, they were, so this goes to belonging. I don't think there was a question that's specific to belonging, but to their well-being. I think a little over half of the students said that I'm doing okay, um, or I'm doing great. I'm, I feel that, I feel the engagement. Um, a little less than 35% maybe said I'm okay. And, and this is, you know, when we have our analysis with our impact team, this is when we start to unpack some of this. And I think about 10% of students said they're not doing okay. So again, that collaboration with other teams who have a, a more direct, um, connection with schools and students, there would be a conversation to just say, what are we thinking and what are the implications of this data and what are the responses or the interventions um, to either dig deeper to have a better understanding or to be responsive to the, to the results. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking too about previous um, opportunities and I think some things that some other departments do as well. I know um, when I was previously on the academics um, team, we did a lot of work with individual teachers and assessing their student voice, getting in that being like the first step to determining, okay, what do you need to work on was really creating surveys, creating opportunities for students to meet individually with their teachers really have open and candid conversations and then using that as baseline data to say, okay, this is what I as a teacher want to work on. Um, so I'm thinking that there are some more informal ways as well that other teams um, that really, you know, work really closely with teachers and doing different um, teacher pro training programs um, that they have off authentic ways also that are more, um, you know, can be delivered more quickly, um, ongoing, et cetera, to assess their student voice. I want to add to that some of the work that I do in terms of customized support for schools. Um, I do work to help teachers unpack their biases so that they're able to engage in these conversations with their students. I help them understand the importance of creating the type of climate where students um, know that they're cared about, they're welcome, the teachers are excited to see them, excited to hear their answers, and they can discuss race, racism, systems of oppression with students so students see teachers step out of their comfort zone and move into a space where the student's voice is valued. And so that's some of the intentional small scale. It happens on many levels in the work that we do. Yeah, 
and other teams do. And I'll just add to that. Um, we, and this is fairly new to us on our team, fairly recent. So we have a, a young man on our team who is leading work. He's in the design and development stage of leading work um, to do more direct service to students. So really assessing what the gaps are. So what is not happening in schools that we might be able to support. And, and this comes out of the African-American Equity Task Force. So I wanna name that. Um, but right now his, his first bit of work is in a partnership with the city of Denver through the My Brother's Keeper um, program, which all of us are probably familiar with. So it's a program called The Lead. And so his first um, phase or engagement of that work is going to be to work with four of our pathway schools creating a mentoring program directly for students. So again, that's in development mode, but that is another way of how we will hear student voice. And then the other fairly recent um, team member that joined our, our staff is our LGBTQ plus program manager. And so again, trying to uncover and raise the voices of our students um, at the intersection there and to make sure that they too um, see themselves here in DPS and to your question of belonging, um, that we have that data around that, our population of students as well. Just so we can switch gears a little bit, can you tell us your first impressions of the No Justice, No Peace resolution and your initial thoughts? Yeah, so I can go first on that. Um, I think when I first saw it, I was excited to hear about the um, work that students were doing. I mean, I, I had a sense of pride um, because I, as I had mentioned earlier, I went to MLK um, and it's, you know, a long, long time ago, um, but just excited to see that students were leading on this initiative and that the adults in their space were taking them seriously. Um, one thing that, you know, I was wondering about with the resolution is what does it look like to, for example, make this African-American history curriculum required for every student and not just black students. Being a product of DPS, having kids in DPS, you know, I know some of the courses that I took in high school, some of the courses my daughters took um, as electives, and those were great, but how do we get this curriculum in front of all of our students, not just our African-American students? Um, but I thought it was a great way to you know, really hold the adults accountable and say, you know, this is what um, students want. This is what you say you want. Let's bring it to the board. Let, let's make it happen. So I was, I was impressed with, um, you know, just that, that leadership within that. I too was impressed with the leadership and I was impressed with the fact that students got their voice all the way to the school board and that a resolution was made. I think you'll be excited to know that it's not just being talked about in your space. For example, last week we had Equity Boot Camp, and it was sponsored by members of the Latinx community. And they talked about the history of the Latinx community in Denver. And they talked about the school walkouts at West High School back in the 70s. And they showed their resolution in comparison to the No Justice, No Peace resolution and, and use it as a comparison of how what was asked for in the 70s and what is being asked for now. And so I need you to understand that your work is being spread maybe in spaces you don't know, it's being talked about in other places. So it has some longevity. So it ha definitely has an impact. And I think that's something to be particularly proud of that as students, as uh, black young women, your work is being acknowledged and recognized and taken forward even without your voice being there. Um, but all the work that we do, we always want our work to move forward. And so um, I think it's one thing to have an immediate impact. It's another thing to see it continue and grow. And already we're seeing it continue and grow. So congratulations on the work. Uh, thank you. And sorry, Mr. No, really quick before you get into um, yours. I just want to correct one thing in our resolution. I feel like one misconception that we've had to nip in the butt before, and I'm happy to do it continuously, um, our resolution, especially with the Black history aspect, is not just a history class that fix focuses on Black history. We already have one of those at our school. It's not specifically getting Black history in one class all across DPS because this resolution is DPS-wise, not just in the far Northeast, or it's not just at our school. It's for every school in DPS. And specifically, it's focusing on getting 
a diverse perspective of history education for all BIPOC students, Black, Indigenous, Hispanic, Latino, Asian. Like, I just feel like a lot of people have kind of gotten that misconstrued because it has to do with us and our work as Black women. They think we're just focusing on Black history. So that's just one really big thing that, one, it's not just focusing on Black history, it's not MLK-centric, and it's focusing on all students in DPS, not just Black students and not just the students at DMLK. And just all aspects of history, not just Black history. And I just feel like that's one really big thing that we need to, like, just set forward before we move forward, because that's, like, the biggest point of a resolution that's for all BIPOC students. I think that's important to clarify, and thank you for that clarification. Um, so just like Dr. Weir and Dr. Harris, I applaud you. Um, I think the work is commendable. Um, I think one of the things I appreciated most specifically about the formatting of the resolution, and then I'll talk more about some other things that resonated with me, is that it was short and to the point. I've read several resolutions in DPS that go on and on and on. And so to me, one of the things that stood out to me first and foremost was that it was short and to the point. Um, I think it is, again, congratulations are in order for the level of national uh, attention that you all are getting. Um, and I feel like it's come full circle, right? Because I remember a time in, um, in, our, in our history where all the news coming out was not positive. And you all have said, uh, hold up a minute, hold on. It has come full circle and we are doing brave things in this school. We are, we are putting, um, you know, even ourselves, you know, proverbially or physically on the line to fight for justice, to fight, to end racism. We are, we are putting ourselves out there. Um, it made me wonder some questions like, you know, how have you incorporated what might be happening in other schools into the resolution? Um, I think the identity development piece is critical. That is some of the work that when I mentioned earlier about um, our program manager for student initiatives is working with the four pathway schools. That is the center of the work is identity development, because we know that when you know who you are, when you know where you've come from, where you know um, who <laughs> is expecting greatness from you, then you are going to do things a little bit different. Um, I think this is an opportunity to fill in the blanks of the books that have the missing pages of our history, right? To fill in the blanks um, where there's a, a particular narrative where we have to change that narrative. And I think what's really powerful for me as I think back to when I started in DPS in the fourth grade at McGlone are the friends that I met there are my very best friends to this day. And I, I just am excited about the bond that you four have probably solidified for the rest of your lives. And so who knows where this work is gonna take you in the next phase of your life. Um, and, and I'll just name this as well, a couple more things. I, again, appreciate you calling out that it is inclusive. I think that's what stood out to me is that it is about all, all uh, marginalized groups and their experiences here, particularly at the local level. And then um, what I would encourage if, if you guys haven't already done so, is that there's such a deep history here in Denver around our marginalized communities. Dr. Ware mentioned the, the West High walkouts, right? And um, I remember my parents, as I've mentioned, our DPS graduates, my dad went to Manuel, my mom went to East. And I remember them telling me stories about the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated and how the, the, the president, I don't know if he was considered a president at that time, but the leader of the Black Panther Party came into their schools and said, let's go, it's time to protest. And so those pieces of history are so critical. And my hope would be that um, beyond what is inside the 365, BH 365, is that there is a very spec specified um, focus on the rich history here in, DP, in uh, Denver, because um, we have done some tremendous things as a community, as communities who have been oppressed and marginalized. We've done some tremendous things and those things are gonna be spotlighted as well. As all of you ladies mentioned earlier, your department has created nine professional development modules surrounding implicit bias, training, and culturally responsive education for adults. Can you talk to us who originated this idea behind these modules and how it came to fruition? Yeah, so the um, equity experience really came out of 
the Black Excellence Resolution, which as we mentioned earlier, came directly from the African-American Equity Task Force recommendations. Um, and so it was important for us not to let the resolution be just that, but that we look at and learn from how professional development has been done in the past. And so we worked with many um, leaders from different divisions. Um, so there are contributors from the equity division schools and um, academics as well to really create and look at um, what do our folks need to really impact their mindset, have them see things differently. And so we started with just, you know, throwing ideas out there, having conversation um, with each other, learning some also from the student experience video that, um, was produced by the CRE team a couple of years ago to kind of hear some of what some of our students were thinking and just start to really put together different ideas for people to examine themselves. Um, it was important for us to, and I think Leslie mentioned this before, not just have a one and done or not just say, okay, you all go through this three hours um, with a staff of 60 and talk about it, but rather um, encourage and really intentionally have people look at themselves individually and then move on at their own pace. Because we also know that people are at totally different places when it comes to equity work. And so that's really how it started. We also engaged um, additional people to give critical feedback to the modules um, from different teams. It started, it, we rolled it out last year. It started with all the central office team members going through the experience. Um, and it's, it's developed or evolved into now a year two of the experience, which has three additional modules, as well as the identification and completion of equity projects that Dr. Ware mentioned earlier. And I'll just add to um, what Dr. Harris has said. So in the beginning, when we were, you know, trying to throw around ideas, so how do we implement what's in the resolution? You know, the resolution is one thing, but it, it didn't give us a blueprint on what the um, design or the implementation would look like. So we had to get real creative. And as she, she mentioned, we, we had to collaborate on this. Um, so in the beginning, it was really messy. It was messy. We were throwing out ideas. We were... We thought we would go down one path and then we would you know, go to another path. And then we realized that what we wanted this to be was truly an experience, that it was not going to be like this compliance, check the box kind of activity, but that we needed to dig deep into people's souls, into their spirits, right? Into them questioning their tolerance. Like when, when I think about tolerance, I don't think about you got to tolerate me. It's about, I need to tolerate what feels discomforted for me. And so it, 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 part of the, I guess the core of the equity experience is an opportunity for people to do the self work. That is what makes this a, a bit unique. I think is that people are expected, our team members are expected to do the work individually first, because then when you start to engage in conversations, on these topics around, again, racism, oppression, anti-Blackness, anti-Asian you know, Asian, um, rhetoric, those kinds of things. Once you've done some self-work, the hope is that you would be less apt to disengage or to avoid the conversation. You would have some fluency, some tools, some knowledge, some skills, and your own experience from which to pull on so that you could be a contributor in that conversation. And so that was also part of um, the design of the equity experience. That's really interesting, especially from what we've seen of the equity experience. And to speak on that, at DMOK, we've been doing equity work for the past seven or so years. So our school is recently at a very different place than the rest of the district. We're proud to say our teachers have voluntarily changed their curriculums, visit the Museum of African American History and Culture, watch our podcast episodes as their own professional development, and have shown positive feedback. Our assistant principal over equity, CJ Smith, personally asked us to watch the equity experience and create podcasts from a student perspective. 
Because of this, we have the opportunity to watch the first two, and we've actually created a podcast for the module Colorblind to Color Brave. And just looking through this, we were curious to see if future modules will have a student-centered focus. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, as Leslie said, when we first started this, we, you know, we're bringing different ideas to the table. It got messy. You know, we <clears throat> also know that um, we can keep working on something and then it's two years later and it still hasn't launched. And so I think that student voice um, is important and definitely something that we can um, consider and have conversation around how do we make sure to include student voice in the modules. I think the example um, that you gave as far as podcast to maybe dig deeper, if you, as you probably noticed that each of the modules has a digging deeper section. Um, and so want to potentially consider offering that as a way for, for folks to engage more with students, just hear from a student perspective. Um, Leslie, Dr. Ware, was there anything you wanted to add into that? I do want to add something to that. Uh, one of the things we're going to be doing with the equity projects is having people refer back to equity experience modules so they can go deeper. One other thing I want to add is, and it was touched on uh, briefly, we know that that three hour, one time room full of people, professional development it does not work in terms of change. And so we were looking specifically at not just doing some modules or doing some work that people had to do, but we we're looking at how can we create content that will create change in the mindsets and the beliefs and the behaviors of people who do this work. And we know that beliefs, which are, you know, and biases, you know, start at the dinner table as children. And so how do we get people to unpack something that's, that's been part of their lives and it's been so comfortable and part of just regular dinner table conversation to now change it into, oh, wait a minute, I've got to do something differently. And so that's why there's time between the modules. That's why it's over uh, nine modules. And then we're adding these last three. And then the content is more than your usual implicit bias trainings. It goes much deeper. And looking at the work that I've looked at in other places, this is very unique work. This is very powerful work. So I wanted to add that piece too. So having so digging deeper um, in having people doing the equity projects refer back to those modules, digging deeper is one of the things we'll be asking them to do. I think one other thing that's important to note is that um, we consider all adults in DPS as educators. We have over 15,000 team members. Um, and I think about a third of those are classroom teachers. And so what's important for us as well is to make sure that all of our DPS team members see themselves and can reflect in the modules. And so we try to, you know, very intentionally balance classroom specific learning or teacher specific PD to just to be a better human, to be a, a person that supports students in some, one capacity or another, not always um, as a classroom teacher. That was really important to us because we know that Yes, it is important for those that are, you know, right in direct contact with students to have this work. And it's also important to remember that a lot of our students, the bus driver is the first adult they see that they're greeted with or some, you know, going through the breakfast line um, that those adults need to engage in this learning as well. And they're not always seen as, you know, the classroom teacher or have that very, um, specific experience. So just bearing in mind too, that this is for all of Team DPS, not just classroom um, specific leaders. I'd like to clar clarify my question because yes, I completely agree that um, this equity work should be included of not just the school teachers or people who directly interact with students, but I also feel like a big, like just a big role because that's a school district. It's adults directly or indirectly serving students. So I just like to clarify what specifically will or has the equity module done to, I guess, give the professional development that all adults need to effectively serve students and not just on a personal level of assessing your own biases or, you know, acknowledging your own lack of equity, but what specifically will the modules do to address how adults interact with students? Yeah, I'll take a, a, a swing at that. So um, you're, you're right, just to reiterate, like we wouldn't be here if it were not for students. So we are very um, clear on that. We understand that. 
Um, and as you, you all are, you know, on the beginning parts of your resolution, you know that this work takes time. And so, you know, it, we, we're not sure what is possible. Anything could be possible. Year three of the equity experience um, could have a more explicit focus on, um, on students and, and really elevating that student voice. Um, so we're, we're, we're always designing, we're always thinking, and it's opportunities like this that sometimes, you know, you have a hidden spot. We're human. We have a hidden spot. And sometimes in, until it's brought to your attention, you haven't quite thought about that. So I would say that our commitment at this point moving forward would be that we're going to take that back and we're going to think about, so year three of the equity experience, what might that look like? You know, just sitting here envisioning it, you know, Dr. Ware's talked a lot about the equity projects. So once we've had teams to identify the inequities that are in their teams and within their locus of control, how do we then come back and, and align that or bump that up again? So what impact has that had for students? How has that practice that we've done in central office impacted students and then have the student voice come in and talk about those implications? I mean, a lot is possible. So I think it's just, it just is some, some com communication some other conversations that we can have in the future. Um, but there, there, there's a lot that is that is possible moving this work forward as we continue to phase it, phase it in and out. I also just wanted to say um, to Danielle's part, Dr. Harris's part, my apologies, um, about everyone being educators. And I think about, you know, if for those of us that have never been teachers in the district, we all have a story to tell about going to the university of, of life, right? Of some of the things that you don't learn in a classroom, we might be able to share those stories with you. And so this also uncovers for those, um, those of our team members who aren't, who don't have um, direct contact with students on a consistent basis. Like, how do I fit into this picture? What is my role? Cause some people, I'm gonna be very honest with you. They don't, they don't see themselves there. My job is to come in and do X, Y, Z. I don't have anything to do with the students. We've heard that before. So this helps us to, um, kind of level set for every adult in the district that in some way or another, you do impact students. And what does that look like? How do you fit into that bigger picture of, of uh, working uh, or, or impacting students? And speaking of, I know that in our first series, we talked a lot about trauma and how that looks in the lives of, specifically because it was from our perspective, the lives of black girls and black boys and how coming into education with those experiences, that stress and that trauma, how it will affect teacher and student relationships. We also talked about ways that, um, just giving the student perspective, ways that students well, teachers can look at students and how they're collaborating with them and being more mindful of the things that they're going through so i know that's one thing that um, teachers definitely said benefited them and was very helpful when looking at how to teach their students and look at their trauma and touch those topics with sensitivity and in addition to the equity experience, are there plans to create mandatory professional developments that are required to prepare teachers and leaders to understand and elevate the history and culture of systemically marginalized communities, as well as being able to, to as well as being capable of delivering lessons that focus on BIPOC trauma with sensitivity as outlined in our resolution? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll start out with this. I was really, I'm excited about this question because it's, we have, I don't know if you all have had an opportunity to talk to Dr. Bailey, perhaps. If not, you probably, um, you know, should have a conversation with her just from the perspective of the history that she has being a former board member, the Bailey report, et cetera. But what is interesting and what um, is resonating with, with me, particularly about the question, is that uh, Dr. Bailey, Dr. Darlene Ledoux, Dr. Antoine Jefferson and Dr. Um, De Castillo are in the middle of their, and I think they're right just about finished with a series called Race in Education, uh, Race in Denver. And it explores the impacts of race in the in various BIPOC communities and the trauma that goes along with it. Um, Dr. De Castillo, I think is specialized in some of that community and collective trauma 
And so um, that is a session that, or a series, I don't know if, what they're calling it, but that is a series that ultimately they wanna make accessible to all DPS team members. Um, so it's not work that comes directly out of our team, but it is work that uh, we will be you know, socializing. We have started to do some of the unpacking in our extended leadership team meetings, which is the direct reports of the superintendent's direct reports. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of potential for that series to spread wide and far. We would absolutely love to have that required for all team members. But again, the, the whole conversation about required and mandatory gets to be a complicated one when you're working in a district with so many people and um, different levels of, of support and, and the infrastructures in which they operate sometimes. But I, I would recommend that if you all have not had an opportunity, that could be a tremendous show for them to come on and talk about some of what they're doing around BIPOC trauma, specifically related to this um, learning and education bigger in the district around, uh, around race. And since you would love for that to be required, I would just like to say we probably have a solution for that, which is the BH 365 curriculum. Black History 360, Black History 365 is an educational entity whose purpose is to create cutting edge resources that invite students, educators, and other readers to become critical thinkers, compassionate listeners, fact-based, and respectful communicators, and action-oriented solutionists. Have you had an opportunity to look at the BH 365 curriculum or perhaps visited their website? I have looked at the website. I uh, got a lot of information from it, but it's not the same as being able to look at the curriculum. Uh, as an educator, I would want to look at it and first of all, look at the lens it's written from and which voices are included or excluded or highlighted. Um, I, I always think about, you know, whenever I read something like that, like to critically analyze and and I'm sure in classrooms you've been told critically analyze what the author wrote, you know, whose whose voice is missing, who, you know, so all of those pieces. It seems very interesting. Uh, as I said, though, I haven't had access to the actual curriculum to really look at it in depth, but I've seen the website. And I just want to go back to the last question for a moment. Um, the other thing that I would tell you is that something that is, is recent, and it's not mandatory, but it certainly is accessible, is that we have um, on our website, and I can't tell you the exact page to go to at this moment, but um, Sylvia Bookhart, who's on our team, has spent over a year putting together a his, an historic timeline here in DPS that um, really highlights particularly, and, and our plan is to um, have timelines for each you know, BIPOC group, but starting out again as a part of the African-American Equity Task Force with a timeline that really highlights some of the racial dynamics um, and then spotlights some of the um, community heroes here in Colorado. So I wanted to make sure that I pointed that out as well. Again, another push for really spotlighting the history um, here in Denver that we have, or in Colorado, actually. Um, your question about 365, um, yeah, I had an opportunity to review some of the information that is um, a part of the work that you all are um, advocating for in DPS. And, um, you know, it just reminds me a lot about the power of youth. And, and when I say that, I mean the power of being young. It made me think back to how when I was a student at Montbello again, at that time was predominantly uh, an African-American student-based leaders, teachers. Um, and then I left to go to CSU and the, the, the cultural shock that I experienced in that. Um, but, but it didn't hinder my, my willingness, my um, drive, my ambition to speak out about um, some things that I didn't think were fair um, on that campus. Um, it made me think about how this work is, I think it was one of the authors on the video on your podcast that talked about the work being in cycles, right? And I remember a time when I was much younger and uh, Gloria Tanner, Senator Tanner, um, first black woman Senator in this state, I was a part of a women's leadership group that she had founded. And she said to us, you all are drinking from wells that you did not help dig. 
And that always sticks with me because again, the work is secular and it's intergenerational. And so I had the opportunity to do intergenerational work with her and her peers through, you know, programs like the Colorado Black Women for Political Action and that kind of thing. Um, specific to the book and um, the work that BH365 does, it makes me, um, it, it made me, as I, I, although I haven't seen the book, and it's interesting because when I saw the book being kind of, you know, touted on Facebook, I reached out to Miss Grayson and said, how do I get a copy? And she sent me the information. Um, but it made me almost resonant with my experience at the African American Museum of History and Culture. Like it was almost, from what I could tell, it's almost like walking through a book, through the vivid pictures that you all have called out, walking through the museum itself, right? That the, the culturally responsive nature of the content that is there. Um, thinking about something that another one of the authors talked about, about it's not just about the history, but it's about how do we create capacity in our young people and in adults for that critical thinking piece. It's much more than just reading the paragraph, right? Um, and so there was a lot that stood out to me. Um, the, um, the differentiated ways of learning, right? We all learn with different modalities, whether we're kinesthetic learners or audio or visual, sounds like the book offers that. And then I'll be honest with you, something that really like was blew my mind was that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they said that Texas has required this curriculum. And, and, and that's for so many reasons that we could unpack, even based on what is happening in our country today, um, with that being a, a huge red state. That is, that's interesting um, to me. So there were a lot, I'd have to say that I, I do wanna get a copy of the book um, for my own personal reasons, my own personal, continued learning learning and journey. I remember at CSU, I had a black history class and our professor, the first thing he told us was, just because you're black, you don't know everything about being black. So I'll leave that there. I go, bam. All right. <laughs> I would just like to say thank you for that. And just a little bit of clarification, Texas has not adopted the book, but several schools in Texas, in Texas have. But even as students, we know that teachers have not been trained to teach black history in that without pro proper professional development, teaching black history will just cause more trauma. I know your department focuses on adult professional development and some of the things that we really like about BH365's professional development is that they focus on one, refusing to accept negative stereotypes, two, displaying biases, three, acknowledging the contributions and challenges of black Americans, four, challenging discriminatory behavior, and five, encouraging progressive moments that would bring more inclusive history and social studies curriculum. With this being said, do you believe the professional developments within the district currently share these same focuses? And if not, do you have plans to revise and align with these? I think what's really important when we talk about professional development, when we talk about curriculum, is that curriculum is just like a, a guide map, right? That you know tells people where to go. But the professional de development is really that how to get there piece. And so one of the things that I think is um, really unique and important about the equity experience, for example, is that we're not telling people where to go specifically, but, but that more of that how to get there, that they're examining their own um, biases, their own stories of anti-Blackness, their own stories of um, gender stories and just single stories. And so hopefully by engaging in professional development like that, it will better prepare them to hear, learn from, go deeper with the stories of other groups, especially when we're talking about marginalized communities. So I think a lot of our professional development may not be you know, very cut and dry, like, okay, this is chapter one or unit one, this is what you need to do to teach this, but rather what are the guide rails to say, oh, I didn't even realize there was so many pieces of our students' histories that were mentioned or 
you know, oh, the biases that I have growing up, like this is how I was taught. So this is what I'm going to teach. Like I hadn't really considered that. And so um, I think that's something that our team focuses on are those professional development opportunities that encourage people to look within and be able to then engage in a curriculum that could be very brand new for them. That's definitely really interesting, um, considering the connections between the two. But just to kind of bring it back to us all as Black women, given that there's never been a Black history curriculum as big as this, or just in general, I'm sure you can understand how enthusiastic we are about this one. And I just like to ask, what can your department do if slash once the Black History D65 curriculum is adopted here in DPS? I think that looking at the website, it came with its own professional development models, um, which I think most books do nowadays um, in terms of, I mean, publishers want that type of work. So I'm presuming it has a professional development model or a curriculum that it wants people to carry out that I would think would first be directed at teachers who are going to teach the curriculum. Um, and so it will more, be more specific to the, that community, probably uh, also the cultural responsive, uh, culturally sustaining team would be a part of that because that's also a piece of the work that they do. And so as I understand, they have a specific curriculum for professional development for their books, for their work. Is that correct? Yes. So I would anticipate that if the uh, school district adopted that, um, that that would be part of the adoption of the work that they would also receive the professional development related to teaching it. Because you're correct. Um, in some of the work that I've done, helping teachers understand that, and I just thought of an experience in my own ed education, but teachers being able to understand how to, how to teach about BIPOC without diminishing and demeaning the lived experiences of BIPOC people. And so that's part of the work. That would be part of the work that the teachers would experience through the academics department. And when I think about what can our team um, CELT do is again, you know, I talk a lot about collaboration and it, it is, it takes all of us to do this work. Um, but, you know, to, to really understand the content ourselves, um, you know, potentially, you know, go through some of the, the training with some of the teachers to understand at a more intimate level, how we, how we might infuse some of the, the messaging, the narratives, how that might align to the work that we're doing around, for example, we've been talking all day about the equity experience, but what might be some pieces inside of the you know, continued phases of the equity experience that we might be able to drop those nuggets of, of history and those nuggets of learning um, inside of that. But that, you know, that'll take some, some design, some design thinking, it'll take, some development and being able to identify where those spaces are. So again, this is a place where I think there's a lot of potential and possibility, um, but you know, we're looking forward to once it is adopted, um, you know, how do we take that and make it accessible for the work that we are doing as well here in DPS with our adult team members across the district. So I wanted to ask if you guys have any advice for us when it comes to the No Justice, No Peace resolution and how we can keep it alive. I think it's very much alive now. I don't think you should anticipate that it's not going to be alive. As I said, I was in a training last week and it was brought up as an example in comparison of um, the student walkouts in West High School. Um, one of the great things about doing really significant work like what you've done is sometimes you have to allow it to have wings and know that it's gonna continue on and people are gonna be talking about it even when you're not present. So I wouldn't anticipate that it's not gonna stay alive. That's the, that's the first suggestion I offer about the work. Don't, don't anticipate that it's not gonna be alive. Anticipate how it's gonna morph and grow. I mean, that's a beautiful thing about the work that we do. Um, you know, you have this intent and then you see people grow in ways that you did, hadn't even anticipated. So I would anticipate it growing and have a greater impact than you and you are even anticipating right now. Yeah, and I would just um, add to what Dr. Ware is saying um, is to just stay consistent in allowing and encouraging adults to um, be reminded of the resolution, 
thinking about how do we continue to hold ourselves as the adults accountable? How do we make sure that we are, um, you know, just always going back to what's in the resolution? Um, but again, like Dr. Ware said, there is a lot of momentum. I just had a couple of ideas about how to keep it alive. Um, you know, one of the things that Maya Angelou said was that all great achievements require time. And so I would, I would encourage you all to give yourself grace, like celebrate the successes that you're seeing, right? Knowing that there is more work, heavier work to come. Um, when I think about the resistance that our team has gotten, the work that we do, like there are even bigger monsters out there waiting to try to devour us. And so give yourself grace in that. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, I don't know what you all have planned in terms of your succession plan. You mentioned that two of you are going to be graduating this year. Um, I believe the, the other two of you are sophomores. Um, uh, so how are you building the internal capacity in the school? How are you engaging other young people and really mentoring and coaching them up so that the, the work will continue in that space that you all have created specifically at DMLK? And then, you know, what might the capacity be to build at other schools? So um, connecting with other groups in schools across the district to get them to, you know, see this work and to, to push it at their local levels. Um, but ultimately, I would say give yourself grace. And finally, if there's an opportunity, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push this because I think our history in Denver is so rich, but if there's a way to incorporate that in there, sometimes it makes it more accessible to people because they can Oh yeah, I've been to that place. Oh yeah, I know that name. Oh yeah, I know that person. Um, that history, that can be an entry point for them into you know, understanding why it's important for them to know about themselves, their history, and to continue their identity development. Thank you for that advice. Um, and just to move on a bit, I know we all have had something on our hearts and just to be honest, as four young Black ladies engaging in this equity work, it hasn't been easy. And we have received negative comments, hate mail, even death threats. However, because we see the need to commence change now, especially when it comes to equity, we continue to prevail in doing this much needed work. Then to learn that we have an equity department that is led by women of color that have yet to reach out to us, not to our principal, but to us, is hurtful. And with that being said, do you have any reason as to why you guys were unable to reach out to us? I can I can take that. Um, yes. And so thank you, number one, for for that question. And thank you for speaking your truth. Um, you know, at our core, I believe that we all as humans want to be acknowledged. We want to be recognized and we want to be celebrated. And I can understand why the lack of connection on our part um, may have been hurtful. It was hurtful, not may have been. You have said that it, it was hurtful. I'm not sure that we can give you any answer that would satisfy that. But what I can tell you is that as flawed human beings, when we know better, we do better. When our hidden spots are brought to our attention, when, when what we have had in the dark is brought to the light, um, what we do with it then is, is, is what I think is, is really important. And you brought this to, um, to, to the light. And so, you know, I could say many things. I could say, you know, charge it to our heads and not our hearts. Um, it wasn't purposeful. It wasn't intentional, but I understand impact. And it, impact you, it impacted you in a hurtful way. And so clearly, I am sorry for that. We apologize for that. Um, and, and what I would ask is, you know, how do we at this point harness the energy that is in this space to learn from it and to move forward? Um, you know, oftentimes you mentioned it, you, you guys have had a heavy lift in this work. It is heavy. And I believe that particularly as black women, there's a, a, a unique heaviness. Um, we are seen as the super women, the super woman of race and equity work. And I'm gonna tell you what, sometimes my letters are missing. But what I would say is that, you know, we talk a lot on our team about black girl magic. What I'm asking of you all is to give us some black girl grace and to give us some black girl forgiveness. Because again, it wasn't our intention, but I understand impact and that, and that we hurt you. And for that, we are sorry. Thank you, Ms. Janelle, Dr. Harris, and Dr. Ware. We accept your apology. We hope that we will be able to collaborate with you in this equity work in the future. 
and we would like to thank you for coming on here and talking to us. I'd like to add one thing. Uh, I also apologize for not reaching out to you. And another piece of work that I do is about radical self-care. And you have to be intentional about caring for yourself to do this work. This is a marathon. This is not a sprint. I've been doing this since I was your age. Um, and, and, and in order to maintain a sustainability and intentionality and impact, um, you have to care for yourselves first. So I encourage you to think about what you're doing for to care for yourselves in this, in this work and to be very intentional uh, to every day, make sure you're doing your best because one of the things I also look at in terms of teaching educators to do this work is you have to be well first to do this work for one thing, the resiliency, and the other thing to be able to think of the creative, creative ideas to create change. We just wanna say thank you for having us. Good luck to you um, and don't give up. Keep pushing forward. This is only the beginning. Thank you again and we accept your apologies. On today's episode, we talked to DPS's equity department, Leslie Janelle, the executive director of culture, equity, and leadership, Dr. Daniel Harris, the senior manager of equity initiatives, and Dr. Fernita Ware, the program manager of equity initiatives. We discussed equity within DPS, as well as next steps the department has and how we can keep our resolution alive. Who leads equity conversations? And do these conversations include everyone in the organization? Here's our call to action. When looking at the work of equity, district and schools must break down silos to remove barriers. Equity work requires us to be inclusive, transparent, and truly collaborative. There's an African proverb that states, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go with others. Collaboration can be time consuming, but the long-term result is almost always better. As humans, we have a natural tendency to want to work hard and stay focused in our particular areas of expertise, but doing so can, co can cause consequences. These consequences being changes can take a long time to implement or the blame game. Equity is everyone's responsibility, so be a silo snatcher and have a un uni unified vision, shared goals and priorities with a commitment to collective success in either your district or your school. Lastly, ensure you have a great adult professional development plan. All adults that work in a district need to be taught how to teach Black, Latino, Indigenous, and people of color celebration, contribute, contribution, and trauma with sensitivity. This doesn't mean we need to be saved. Adults just need to be better equipped to deal with the hard conversations that come with being anti-racist and learn to avoid white savior mentalities. Make sure you guys give us your feedback through our social media and contact us for a chance to be on the show and give us your take.